Um, he has helped curate the exhibition of Gilbert's work, which I've just learned the official title, Gilbert Lewis Awkward, Te Awkward Tenderness, that is at will, that will be online at, um, on the website of the William Way Center. It was supposed to open this summer, but we all know why that didn't happen. Um, and the Gilbert's, th Gilbert's work will be on sale there. 30% of it will go to the William Way Center and the rest of it will go to Gilbert's care at the Wincote House. Um, Aaron now lives in Long Island where he is teaching art to high school students. So with that, I will open the floor to you, Aaron, and I think you're all in for an, a lovely treat. Thank you, you know what, very if, much. If I, can, if, if, if I can just add something, this is Bill Valerio, the director of Woodmere, and I just want to thank Aaron for all of the input that he has had into Woodmere's exhibition of Gilbert Lewis and say that a year ago, uh, Woodmere does have an annual purchase prize at the PAFA annual student exhibition. And a year ago, we awarded that prize to Aaron. So I wanted everyone to know that Aaron is also an artist represented in Woodmere's collection. And we're very proud and excited about that. I know that my friend Brad Richards, who's on this call, who's also a wonderful collector here in Philadelphia, acquired a wonderful work of art from that very same exhibition. And um, Aaron, it's very special to have you talking about Gilbert's work from the point of view of a practicing artist and to share with us how an artist looks at the work of a fellow artist. So I just want to say thank you to you and um, you know, acknowledge your work in Woodmere's collection. And now I will shut up and hand it over to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I'm so gonna intervene once I forgot to just give a couple of little rules. Um, Aaron is gonna go through his presentation and we're gonna ask you to hold questions. I will follow them in the chat room unless it's something that's time sensitive and urgent and you need to ask it, then just go right ahead. But for right now, if everybody could just mute themselves. And like I said, I will follow all your comments and questions in the chat room and you'll have an opportunity to talk with Aaron at the end, unless you need to talk with him before. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron. All right, thank you. I'm sharing my screen. And we can get started. All right. So um, this is called Lessons Learned Through Gilbert Lewis. Um, and I have been, the first time that I saw a Gilbert Lewis painting was in a show that was put together through the William Way Center last summer to celebrate um, the 50th anniversary of uh, the Stonewall Riots. And um, I immediately fell in love with his work. And so when I was asked to be a part of the William Way Center show retrospective that they were putting together, I jumped at the chance. And I have been thrilled to be in such close contact with his work. Um, because it really speaks to me and um, and I am a huge fan. And so uh, when I was have been studying his work, I um, realized that we had a lot in common. He is a, an alumni of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, as am I, and he also taught classes there. Um, and I came to the, the idea that wondering what I would have learned from him had our paths been able to cross at PAFA. Um, and so rather than lamenting, uh, what could have been if I had met him, I instead looked to his paintings and tried to learn something from them. Um, about what it means to be a figurative painter in today's world. Um, so one of the biggest takeaways from 
Lewis, um, I think is his command over a medium and his choice, specific choice of the medium that he uses. Um, he, there's only one oil painting in the show at the Woodmere and the rest are uh, gouache paintings and graphite drawings. Um, and so that specific choice of, to use an aqueous medium kind of puts him in line with um, a long history of, uh, of egg tempera painters, starting all the way back um, even before the early Renaissance. But that's why I put a portrait of a young man by Botticelli. And then in more recent years, uh, some more contemporary artists, Paul Cadmus and George Tooker, who along with Lewis were part of the queer community. Um, and so all of them were drawn to uh, an aqueous medium, which allows for a much finer level of detail. Uh, egg tempera is made up from a series of hatching, uh, uh, small lines that are laid over each other. Um, and so Gilbert in his work is also able to capture that fine level of detail, but gouache can also be used to put large areas of more expressive paint strokes and graphite uses in a similar way. So that's why I'm going to start with um, one of his largest graphite drawings. Um, it's 70 inches long, so that shows just how large scale it can get, but um, he utilizes the, and it exploits the um, key characteristics of his chosen material. And if anyone has worked with graphite, they know that it has a tendency to smudge, but rather than trying to avoid that, he embraces that quality of graphite. Um, and works with large clouds of, of soft tone, uh, tones of graphite and pulls out details from that. So I have some details. These are pictures that I took in the museum when I was looking at the show, um, just to show going from like a far away view to something up close, you can see just how fine the details can get. Um, and so on the left hand side, we have a close up of the face, and then below it, a close up of the legs. And you see these short and direct strokes that are made with a pencil. And on the legs, they, they're thin and delicate, and they kind of wisp along the thigh. Whereas in the face, they're more. Um, they're bolder and harsher, which brings an added drama to the face, facial features and differentiates the texture that appeals to the eye as you walk across, or as you like move your eye across the body. Um, and so it was something I also find really magical that happens in his drawings is how he's able to use a thin and delicate line um, with it to pull out specific details and um, name objects within his drawing from this like mist of charcoal, which happens um, in the other three details, the hand that's being raised up, um, the hand that's grasped at, the, at his chest, and the tube that's coming out from his shorts at the bottom of the drawing. So, um, Gilbert is not doing very much. He, he has these broad areas of tone and then he just pulls out these very specific um, and direct lines, which offers the viewer um, a rewarding experience of looking at the drawing from both a macro level uh, from far away and a micro level um, when you get up close. And so a similar uh, shift of scale happens 
in this drawing, the seated nude, um, where when you go up close to the drawing, you can see he per first puts down a layer of, um, of like misty graphite, and then he's able to pull out these delicate fine lines, especially in the pubic hair. And it's just that soft texture that he's able to achieve by, um, by layering uh, these different marks on top of each other. And he takes this a step further when he goes about uh, drawing the, the sheets that are below the model. I had, a, I had a critic named Kyle Staver, who's a really amazing painter um, and an amazing critic. And she once told me during one of our sessions that I needed to look at artists like Fragonard and Delacroix in order to learn how to paint what she called sexy sheets. And I think what she meant by that is that by um, committing ourselves to objects outside of the body with the same um, expression and sensitivity, uh, we can transfer an emotional quality onto the inanimate. So I think that's something that Lewis is able to really capture. He carves out from his mist of, of graphite with his eraser, he carves out these folds and the highlights of, of the blanket. And then he goes back on top of it with these thin lines that are much more expressive and quickly drawn these like hatch marks to uh, decorate it with a floral pattern. And so by combining these two different tempos of and rhythms of drawing, it really creates like a feast of the eye, for the eye, which can hold up against the, the beauty of the figure that he's, um, he's drawn. So another key thing that I've taken away from Gilbert's work is the power of caricature, which I think is something that's often overlooked because it's associated with sarcasm as it, um, as it uh, overemphasizes the, probably the not so flattering aspects of the sitter, but the way that Gilbert is able to use it um, through a lens of compassion and sensitivity, he's able to get at something that a photograph or an academic rendition of someone is not able to capture. Um, and so I think part of that has to do with the way that he applies his material. Um, I took some close-ups of these uh, and they're from my phone. So the contrast and the colors are a little bit off, but I think it helps you see better the way that they're painted. Um, he starts with this kind of wandering line of graphite that's thin and you can almost, on the left-hand side, you can almost see his hand like traveling across the page, trying to pinpoint um, the presence of the person there. And these are all very small paintings. They were done in person at the, um, at the uh, care center where he worked. Um, and so they were done one-on-one -on -one in short sessions. And the brevity of the sessions, I think, also ties to, um, and the immediacy of it ties to him, like really capturing the essence of the person. Um, the way they're painted, he allows the midtone of the page to come through, which not only allows the, the skin tones to vibrate against something, um, which is really beautiful, especially in this one with the green background, the rose colors of the cheeks and everything just pop forward. Um, but you can also see the individual marks 
as if the person is like emerging from the page. Um, yeah, and so these are all nine by 12. So it's um, lending itself to an intimate viewing ex experience and really draws the, the viewer in to not only engage with the, the face, but um, also the patterns on the clothes something that Gilbert really excels at. And this is once again, utilizing um, his material to the fullest. Gouache is a very, can get very flat. Um, and so when he's putting in these patterns, it kind of lends itself to that, that flat and graphic quality. So along the lines of um, caricature, we next have uh, a work where he applies the ideas of character, caricature to the entire figure. Um, so I included the one on the right to kind of show um, where the deviant lies within the, the standing figure. Um, he's a tall, gangly, um man and this is emphasized by the way that um gilbert has the the top of the head touching the um the edge of the paper and the toes also kiss the bottom of the paper and it really emphasizes the confines of the paper in which um the figure figure is put um his arms dangle at his side and they, his hands are, the wrists are thick and the hands are heavy. Um, and, but even more than just uh, a purely vertical standing figure, there's a slight sway to the body, which um, to the right. And this is offset by his hips and his shoulders, which have a, a slight tilt to the left. And so that gives a, um, a kind of rhythm to an otherwise static pose. Um, and so you can see how, how overemphasized the squashed nature of the, the figure's head is on the, in the standing pose by comparing it to the, um, the seated figure. Uh, his head is uh, much longer and his feet feel stable on the ground. And that um, reinforces the idea that he's a seated, that he's seated and, and grounded. Um, so, to go along with the idea of caricature, we also bring in the idea of um, the character, caricature of gender. Um, so here we have a, uh, a male in drag on the right and a male dressed in um, a tuxedo on the left. And while these were painted at separately at different times, um, the way that they're positioned in the galleries directly next to each other brings them into conver conversation with each other. Um, and so drag is, can be seen as an exaggeration of the feminine ideals. And by placing that next to um, a man dressed in a suit, you, it calls into question whether this maybe is an exaggeration of masculine ideals, even though it's thought of as a more conventional um, depiction of a male sitter. Uh, and this is emphasized by the starkness of the background. He doesn't include anything else, which brings all the focus onto the, the bodily um, presence of his sitters. So I'm going to go back one slide. 
and talk about these two paintings, which are in the same gallery. They're not next to each other, but they share um, many similarities in their subject matter um, and with a, a seated figure shirtless. But I think that the way that they're handled um, creates a very different uh, effect and mood for the viewer. Um, on the right, we have a seated figure where you can see the entirety of the body. Um, his neck is elongated and his arms are draped over his, um, his pant legs and allowing you to see his feet also adds to um, the drape of the body. Um, it's very elongated and um, this adds to a sense of like comfort, uh, which when you it, you, it leads you up to the, the stare of the, of the sitter, you're greeted with a direct um, glance back and he directly addresses you. Whereas in the interior, um, 1988, uh, the figure's arms, the torso is viewed um, straight on and his arms fall into his lap, almost creating like a circuit that um, cuts you off from cuts off the, seat, the sitter from the space of the viewer. Um, he's completely self-contained within, within the picture frame. Um, and his shoulders are rolled forward, allowing the clavicles to expand and creating this triangle with his shoulders that lead you up to his stare that um, trails off the page and does not address the viewer. Um, so it feels much more inward looking. Um, and then on either side of this figure, you have a lot of activity. On the left, you have all these objects made up of very small shapes um, of color. And on the right side, you have this plunging space into a totally different room. And so, having all of that activity surrounding the body draws your eye away from the subject and almost as if you're looking through the figure, um, your, your eye is drawn around. And what's really interesting is that if you see this painting in person, the way that the body is painted, um, it's through translucent layers of hatching of the gouache. And what that does is creates an almost like ghostly effect as if you really could see through the skin of the, of the figure. And you contrast that with the surrounding space of the figure on the right. And it's very, um, it's once again, very stark, which, everything draws you back to the, the stare and the gaze of the, um, of the sitter, which directly addresses you. All right. Uh, next, we're moving on to um, this portrait of, um, of a young man that directly um, engages in a lineage of art history. And we can tell that um, Gilbert was interested in um, called Copic portraits, um, Egyptian, when Egypt was ruled by Rome, uh, there came about um, these like funeral portraits that were very detailed in a, a Romanesque way. Um, 
And that was a, from the same inspiration of the Byzantine Empire, which I have an example of above that, um, Christ dressed as a Byzantine em emperor. Um, and so some key hallmarks of Byzantine art are large fields of um, gold foil that surround uh, religious figures. Um, and that's done to depict an ethereal vision of heaven, something that can't be um, like dictated by worldly objects or anything. So it has to be felt in some other way through the light of, of gold foil, reflected on gold foil. Um, and so some other characteristics of Byzantine art are the elongation and thin long noses and large um, captivating eyes, which you can see in the portrait on the left. Um, and so I think maybe that is why um, this particular subject uh, attracted uh, Gilbert Lewis so much. Um, there are two other portraits of him in the, in the gallery next to this one. So you can see that, um, that uh, these facial features are not just an exaggeration done by Lewis, but really are a part of, of the, the sitter. And so he also um, uses both a dark and a light line, which you can see in the um, close up that I put on the right hand side. Um, and what this does is it kind of has a flattening effect on the figure and posterizes him, uh, which calls back to the um, Byzantine art where it was all very um, flat and graphic, uh, especially in something such as a mosaic. And Gilbert also includes a kind of gold um, field against the figure, except instead of just um, containing the gold to the background, he incorporates it into the figure with this warm orange glow in the figure's skin, as if he's trying to capture the divinity from within the body. Um, and so his skin starts to, to glow and shimmer, almost as if it's um, comparable to the, the gold chain that's wrapped around his neck. Um, so this is the last painting that I have to talk about, but um, this is another painting by Gilbert that is directly engaging a lineage of art history. Um, which is the reclining nude. So I have several examples of some uh, reclining nudes throughout history, starting with um, a very famous painting by Georges Jean, The Sleeping Venus, and then on to Ong with the Odalisque and the Slave, um, and then all the way to uh, a painting that you can see in the Barnes Museum, actually. So it's a pretty local painting for all you Philadelphians um, by Modigliani. Um, so historically, the, the reclining nude has been reserved for the female body. Um, it's seen as a passive um, pose for a body to be in. Uh, it's very languid and as opposed to like a historic um, pose for a male body, which would be an active standing pose or doing some kind of physical activity. But the reclining pose that was made um, 
made uh, popular by artists like Ong was desired for its heightened sense of sensuality with, with its incorporation of a, a serpentine line, which is like an S-shaped body that a S shaped line that flows throughout the body. Um, so Gilbert not only um, disrupts this archetype, um, archetypal trope of the female body engaged in the reclining pose by, by instead putting a male body in that, that pose, but he also allows for the sitter to directly um, gaze out at the viewer and engage the viewer through eye contact, um, which allows him some sense of authority over his sensuality and desire. So the bleached atmosphere um, of the painting and the way that the body is hugged on both sides by these fields of um, a very light color brings to mind the painting from the barns, the Modigliani. Um, in that painting, you can see that, that the light body is um, encapsulated by these dark red, um, red colors, which, um, which compress the waist and heighten the um, the voluptuousness of the the hips, and in a similar way, um, the light surrounding Gilbert's Gilbert's painting um, emphasizes the the uh, curves of the body and transforms the hips and the rib cage into mountains and the stomach into a valley and creates a kind of landscape through which we can um, walk with our eyes. And so the open and languid form of the body um, al allows us to travel freely across it um, and see everything, including the genitals, so everything is readily available to to be consumed um, and so that brings me to some final remarks um, i am thinking about um what i share in common with gilbert and why he is such an important artist to me. And I think not only is it um, our shared uh, fascination with the male figure or our love of painting and painting history, but I, I was reading this book, um, On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vaughn. Um, and it kind of solidified what I find important in in art and what I think art can do for a viewer. And that is to, um, it allows us an opportunity to share our perception of the world. And even if a viewer doesn't relate to it, or if they are able to find some kind of comfort in a, a shared experience, with what we've made. Um, either way, they're engaging in a different perspective from their own. And that allows us to create a more um, empathetic and um, caring society, I think. So I think Gilbert really um, heightens that, not only sharing his perception of the world, but um, he's able to tell the stories of his many sitters to allow us to see the, um, the perspectives of a whole range of people. So on that,
I would like to open this up for any questions. Um, there were no submissions into the chat room, but I, for Aaron, I thought that was a really wonderful way to look at, you know, looking through your eyes as an artist and seeing and appreciating the marks um, and leading us into how that reveals something so, um, you know, it just it, tell, it tells a story about people, whether it's with them and their environment or just their faces. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that. I thought that was very nice. Um, Rachel, our assistant curator, is asking, Gilbert was a very social person. Those who knew him said he, wait a minute, Rachel. Those who knew him said he was always thinking about who he could paint. When he saw someone he liked, he would say, I want to paint him. Does Aaron, do you have a similar approach and how do you select your models? Um, at the moment, I, uh, I'm much more insular with my models. I, I mainly do use myself as a reference and, um, uh, my partner as well. Um, but I, I think, I mean, I would like to branch out and try to engage other people's stories, but at the moment I'm more concerned with trying to unravel my own like personal um personal story or experiences so any other thoughts or comments i would really encourage anyone who um is in Philadelphia and hasn't been able to see the show so far to do so because a lot of the things that I was talking about um, regarding like a shift of scale can only be appreciated when seen in person. Um, yeah, they're really wonderful. Yeah, and you can get tickets if you go to Woodmere's website. Um, we are, I think, allowing a few more people in, um, I think every 15 minutes now, same amount of people, but um, you can get tickets if you go to Widmere's website to see the exhibition, which will be up through the end of October. And I was just looking up on, I think it's October 8th, we have um, Christopher um, Reed from um, Penn State who will be talking on Gilbert Lewis as well. So. Um, Tune in for more. Oh, and I have a question. Oh, good. Um, Aaron, I thought that was beautiful. And I'm just sitting here like painting, listening to you. Um, I'm wondering what inspires you? Um, like studio and stuff. So I, it's definitely coming from, um, personal experiences and then also looking at art history. I, um, I definitely take a lot from art history and I feel like the most um, excited when I'm just looking for new, at new paintings that I've never seen before. So just keeping my eye open, um, but yeah. Awesome. Hey, Aaron, it's Brad. So you uh, started off this talk thinking about like you didn't actually connect with Gilbert Lewis at PAFA, but uh, in that imagined world or what have you learned from, you know, looking at his work here at, at, at Woodmere and, and also at William Way that sort of like informs kind of your art? Like, did you learn stuff from him or how do you see yourself in the you know, the continuum of, uh, of, you know, Philly trained artists and especially people that are interested in portraiture and people and, and you know, did, did you, what, what did you resonate with his work? What vibe for you? Well, so I think coming from like an academic tradition at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, um, I feel like his interpretation of his sitters is 
much less rooted in like trying to accurately depict the person um, and much more about the way um, like he perceives them or what he's drawn to about them. And so I think that's something that I am interested in and something that I um, hope to like work on and get better at rather than trying to make something um, as accurate as I can or upholding like um, academic standards of, of the figure, um, letting that go for the sake of trying to find something more um, more in relation to my connection with the subject. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Totally. Aaron, we have two questions, um, but I also just wanted to say a comment on something you just said in terms of Gilbert. I think um, I, one of his models, I can't remember if it was Tony or not, I think it was Tony, who at one point said, that doesn't look like me, and Gilbert's response was, well, that's the way you look to me. Mm -hmm. So kind of um, underscoring what you're saying. Anyway, a, a question, are there different kinds of work at the William Way Show? Or can you talk a little bit about that exhibition? Yeah. Um, so we have a whole range of sizes. And um, th so it, they're all, they're, for the most part, they're gouache paintings, um, ranging in size from, there's a lot of smaller works um, that are quicker um, and less finish. And then there's also some more developed pieces that are larger in scale. Um, I'm not sure exactly how big they are, but about like 30 by 40. Um, and so there, um, we've kind of sectioned them into like portraits and nudes. So there's a range from that, but they're all male sitters. Um, but it's a, it looks like it's going to be a great show and I'm really excited to be a part of it. So I'm hoping that it will come out in the coming days. So keep an eye out. And another question um, asking if you could say a few words about Gilbert's show at the Pennsylvania Academy that's about to open soon. Um, so I have only seen um, I was sent like a PDF of a, a slideshow with the selection of it, but um, it's called Only Tony and it's um, a selection of portraits and uh, figure paintings of one specific model named Tony throughout Gilbert's career over a span of, I'm not sure how many years, I think it's over a decade, but um, it's really interesting to see how his perception of a model can change over time. Um, so goes back to what I was saying about the way he views his sitter. Um, and all of, so even if it is the same sitter, he's able to, just depending on like his mood or how he feels up towards the sitter that day, can um, change the outcome of the painting, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. So Aaron, you've put up some examples of your work and how people can reach you. Yes, it's there. <laughs> yeah, Aaron's um, paintings are beautiful. They really are beautiful. Um, I was going to say that on October 8th, we have Christopher Reed, who is the author of Art and Homosexuality, A History of Ideas, and he will be speaking at, well, he will not be speaking at Woodmere. He will be speaking probably from Penn State, but he will be speaking via Zoom. So um, please come and enjoy that. And um, if anybody has any other thoughts or comments, otherwise we can say good night. But thank you, Aaron. That was a wonderful journey through Gilbert's work. It was nice to get up really close. You know, you don't get that on Zoom, all those details, and typically. Um, so that was really nice to say it, you know, to see it. And just your appreciation for his marks and his touch is really wonderful.
So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Aaron. Great job. Another comment. Great job, Aaron, from Steve. I missed it. But anyway, and nice getting to know you a little bit. Let's keep in touch. I'd love to see your work sometime in person. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, so I have family on Long Island. Maybe at some point, my sister in Port Washington, I can have an opportunity to work in person. Yeah, I'm just painting out of my, um, my sister's bedroom at the moment. So <laughs> you're welcome to stop by anytime. <laughs> well, she's not far from you, so. <laughs> all right, have a nice night. Yeah, you too. Thank you all. Thank you for coming.